basically a real life scenario. Right? So I was hired a month ago by Prologis. Prologis is an 18 billion dollar real estate investment trust. <clears throat> this is the first time that they've ever hired a uh, strategic research director. They've asked me to basically build an institutional grade strategic research vertical within the real estate investment trust to be able to conduct global research. We are a global platform. We basically buy and build large uh, warehousing distribution facilities all across the world. We basically have major clients in the technology hardware space. We also have Amazon, we have FedEx, and we have, uh, UPS. Not all of our major clients that we build and buy warehousing distribution facilities for on a global basis, on a global platform. Most of our uh, properties are located in uh, port cities, uh, uh, airports. Uh, our facilities are on the tarmacs. Uh, trucking facilities, airport facilities, port facilities, uh, along intermodal uh, trucking uh, terminal lines on a global basis. Uh, we, uh, the, the firm was originated in the uh, late uh, 1980s, in the early 1990s. They announced that they would go to a global platform uh, in uh, mid-1995. Uh, and they've basically been executing on this plan. They went from $2 billion uh, in assets under management to $18 billion as of today. They are the largest industrial REIT in the uh, REIT sector, particularly in the industrial space. And the next competitor uh, in our space uh, basically has a, uh, an asset value of roughly uh, $6 billion. So we're double the largest uh, in the space. We're the most dominant. And when we went public, in uh, the early 1990s and the mid 1990s, uh, you need to take these uh, when you come in. When we went public, uh, the majority of our uh, investors were institutional pension funds, um, and we convinced them to basically give us their properties in exchange for securities in our company. We're the only REIT that has actually done that, actually took our institutional business and we did an up-reach structure, and we became a publicly traded real estate investment trust uh, in mid-1995. We have large institutional ownership, we syndicated and deals with our institutional investors, and since we have such a large institutional investor presence, when we do secondary offerings, such as secondary offerings or seasoned equity offerings, the majority of those offerings are taken up by our institutional clients. Our institutional clients are there too, to buy our preferred stock, and basically buy our bonds along the whole term structure of our, uh, of our liability structures. And they also co-invest with us um, in our in partner individually on individual transactions. Do they have voting rights? Yes. Uh, we have uh, voting rights because they're basically, uh, we're a C-Corp or, or a REIT. Uh, when we issue the shares, it's one vote, one share. Okay, but the institutional investors make up a significant portion of the ownership of the, of the company. These are pension funds. Right. Then we have large institutional ownership of mutual funds that also include our uh, company shares in the mutual funds, and we are also listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and we are in the uh, S&P 500. Mm -hmm. okay. So they hired me to basically build the first institutional grade research vertical uh, within the real estate investment trust. And I'm making the presentation to you today as the board of directors and senior level managers to be able to communicate my vision of what an institutional grade research vertical would look like uh, within a real estate investment trust of this size. Uh, the presentation is Institutional Research Foundations for Emerging Securities and Real Estate Capital Markets. Since we are a publicly traded company, we're going to analyze the capital markets. And since we invest in real estate, we'll look at the economy and we'll look at the uh, real estate markets uh, within the individual countries on a global basis. So today I'm going to go over institutional foundations for efficient capital markets, prerequisites for efficient security markets, prerequisites for efficient real estate markets, the role of institutional investors in the allocation of capital, and what is the role, what is your role, as a real estate and financial economist or a managing director of research, uh, what is your role within the company and then outside of the company, how do you drive strategy uh, at the top level of the organization to guide the organization be able to make decisive decisions on an ongoing basis. And then a hypothetical capital market research program, what would it, what would it look like? 
So as we know, real estate is interdisciplinary and it's cross-sectional in nature. So you have to know a little bit about everything when you're doing the analysis. Uh, just being an, an accountant and applying the accounting analysis just isn't going to be good. You have to understand financial systems and capital markets. You have to understand financial accounting and managerial accounting. But you have to understand how you're going to raise capital in the capital markets. And if the capital markets in which you're raising capital are efficient and liquid. Uh, you have to understand the economic systems in which you're investing in. When you go to Africa and you go to Asia and you go to Latin America and you go to Europe, um, the institutional structures are different. The economic systems are different. The monetary policy, the uh, central banking, the fiscal policies and taxation are very different and you have to understand that because that's either going to have a direct or indirect impact on the value of your properties over the long run and your portfolio. You have to understand the political systems in which policies are being enacted within the country. Is it a democratic system, a parliamentary, a representative democracy? Is it authoritarian? Is it, is it, are we looking at a socialistic country? Is it social welfare? Is it corporatist? Is it liberal? You have to look at all of those things to be able to understand how policies are being formatted, format, formulated, enacted, and what the policy outcomes are going to be, either intended or unintended. You have to understand the legal systems um, in which the properties and your property ownership um, are being affected by. Uh, is it a rule of law? Is it contract enforcement? Do you have private property rights? Do you have private property rights enforcement? Can I own the land in China? No. So I don't own the land in China. China can basically take my property at any time in the future if they want to. They can nationalize my business if they want to. But if you're in a Western uh, civilized democracy basically based on civil law and common law, you know, from England and the Commonwealth, then you're going to have uh, property right enforcement and, and uh, legislation. And then uh, philosophical systems of morality and ethics uh, will also determine your ability to operate within those countries. And is the philosophical systems a derivative of theological systems and institutions within those companies that you're operating? <coughs> so you have to understand uh, morality and ethics and business ethics and the ability to do transactions and communicate within those countries. So they're, it's multidisciplinary, uh, it's cross-sectional in nature, and you have to understand the interrelationships between all of these uh, areas. Efficient global real estate and security capital markets require strong public and private sector cooperation, disclosure of government and corporate financial conditions, and institutional and individual investor confidence in both the financial and political system. If you go global and you don't have this, you're going to have a misallocation of resources. If you have a misallocation of resources, you're going to get underproduction, underemployment, you're going to get low and fall into maybe negative real uh, wage growth, you're going to get lower social welfare and standard of living the, in the end. So I use this, this as basically the, the hypothesis test before I go into any country um, and try to answer that question. If the majority of the, the answers are yes, then we'll look at going into that country. If the majority of the answers are no, we're not going to go into that country. It's, it's too risky. You need to have a clear determination and communication of economic and political policy goals. As a corporate executive, when you're uh, developing strategy, you have to align the strategy with policy objectives and policy goals laid out by the governing institutions in the country in which you operate. Um, you need government commitment to long-term financial stability. If the, if the country and the central bank cannot manage interest rates and inflation in their own currency, that's going to create instability and more risk. Um, are the monetary and fiscal policies, do they promote capital formation? Uh, and I'll talk about privatization and securitization later. These are the prerequisites uh, that we're using as guidelines before we go into a country. <coughs> price stability. Uh, you need to have price stability promoting consumer confidence and saving. Do you have price stability in Venezuela today? Mm -hmm. No. A million percent inflation, 90% uh, of the population lives in poverty, and it's just a total disaster, and the institutions have totally collapsed, just like Syria and Libya and other failed states. Um, you need privatization and securitization of new and used capital stock. That's the first thing that you usually do in these emerging markets, is the governments will basically open up the economy, they will privatize their government-owned corporations, they will securitize them, and they will create a capital market and a stock market to channel foreign capital through these stock market institutions 
into these public and private institutions, public institutions, to be able to channel capital for capital formation to develop their, their markets and get the investment in so that they can develop their economies. We need strict government, governmental and corporate disclosure requirements. You need transparency. That's where gap accounting comes in at international gap standards for disclosures of financial information uh, by these global firms, multinational corporations. And you need transparency by governments to be able to lay out transparent policy goals and policy objectives and outcomes. Because if you don't have uh, government transparency and policies, then how do you as a business make decisions? You're going to be affected negatively by policy surprises coming out from the, from the government. So you need transparency and disclosures by both government and corporations. And you need standardized reporting systems for examination. Efficient global security markets require a strong macroeconomic infrastructure based on the enforcement of private property rights. I'm not going into a country if I can't own the property, if I can't own the land. If somebody tries to take my land or encroaches on my land or basically uh, is trying to take my land, we have to have enforcement um, by uh, police power to basically enforce my private property rights and inject the individual or take them through the court system <coughs> to protect my assets and to, and to protect my, my rights. So you need enforcement of private property rights, which is critical. You need an accepted medium of, of exchange for low-cost investment transactions. It's really hard to go into Africa to basically build these uh, facilities because a lot of the country currencies are not easily uh, exchangeable. So I might have to exchange you know, from dollars to euros and euros to Boswani and whatever it is. I might have to go through another medium of exchange to be able to actually transact within that country because their own currency markets are not very deep and very liquid. And maybe they have hyperinflation. So there could be other issues associated with their currencies. I need a strong, we need a strong macroeconomic infrastructure consisting of develop, a developed legal system based on contracts, corporate law, and securities law. Standardization, we need a well-developed legal system with attorneys um, and judges um, that are unbiased that will basically uh, make decisions, particularly the judge, based on precedent or some type of moral or ethical legal philosophy that's consistent with international standards. We need standardized accounting and disclosure requirements, either GAAP or international GAAP. We need equitable and efficient regulatory tax system, a progressive tax system, not a regressive tax system. We need a progressive tax system. <clears throat> in government oversight of public and private financial institutions and markets to avoid Asymmetric information issues, adverse selection, and moral hazard. Asymmetric information is I'm an institution, I want to lend to a borrower, uh, give them a mortgage on a commercial property, uh, but I can't get the financial information uh, of the borrower's credit. I can't get information on the property and the property accounting and disclosures. I can't get the title, and I can't get I can't verify the private property rights. Um, I can't verify the market information because I have either erroneous information, lack of information, or no information. So how do I make investment decisions with a lack of information? The information costs are too high. The other problem is, is the moral hazard issues, where basically I'm an insurance company and I basically insure a borrower, and once the or insure the uh, insured, and I find out that once the insured gets, let's say, auto insurance or life insurance, they start to drive recklessly um, because they know they have the auto insurance and they know they have the life insurance. So the moral hazard basically creates an adverse situation. Adverse selection is the borrower basically gives us erroneous information that makes them look like a better credit. And we end up lending, up lending to them, and we end up finding out that the property is defective. The creditor has basically been bankrupt before, and we find out that the mortgage uh, that we lent to them, the money was misappropriated, they can't pay it off, and the property or the collateral is damaged. That's adverse selection. Um, you need independent central banking system, uh, where the policy tools and the policy goals are focused on price stability. Uh, yes, some inflation, but not hyperinflation. Uh, interest rate stability. Uh, you can't have volatility in interest rates. It makes it really hard 
uh, for the capital markets. Just imagine if mortgage interest rates are, are highly volatile or discount rates are highly volatile. You wouldn't lend. You wouldn't buy securities. You wouldn't buy real estate um, if interest rates were extremely volatile. And currency stabilization. Does the, does the central bank or the treasury, um, do they have enough currency reserves to stabilize their currency, to stabilize the exchange rate? to allow for stability um, and for investors, particularly international investors, to invest in the country because the currency is stabilized. Maybe some type of managed float system seems to be the best. And then the central bank has to be the lender of last resort. Has to be there when capital markets fail, or property markets fail, or security markets fail within the country. They are there to basically provide the liquidity as a backstop, to provide a floor on asset price declines, and to be able to move into the market to stabilize it and cure the market, failure using monetary policy and monetary policy tools. Uh, you need financial market liber liberalization. When these emerging markets start to liberalize, uh, they uh, create a convertible currency into the major currency. So you have uh, low transaction cost convertibility and liquidity uh, to carry out transactions. You need market liquidity, uh, breadth and depth of liquidity. Uh, you need different types of investment classes, speculators, and other types of investors to provide that liquidity. You need uh, rights of ownership. Uh, you need privatization and securitization. And it needs to be effective. <coughs> Southeast Asian, the Southeast Asian tigers are probably really good examples. <coughs> and Eastern Europe are good examples of privatization and securitization, opening up their economies and moving towards a global trade, export-oriented economic model. So what are the outcomes from this? Uh, you get capital formation, you get financial innovation, you get efficient allocation of resources, and you get creation of wealth and, and a more equitable di distribution of that wealth. Efficient global real estate markets require a strong financial and legal system based on the enforcement of private property rights and land use restrictions. Imagine if you go uh, into a country and they don't have zoning laws, and they don't enforce zoning laws. If you, if you go to China and India, you see it. If you go to Houston, is another good example. You go, you build housing and housing tracks on one side, and then you have manufacturing facilities that are basically polluting, and the wind, prevailing winds basically blow all that toxic pollution into the residential areas. That's not land use. You have to separate the land uses. You have to separate commercial, residential, manufacturing. Those land use restrictions basically allows for capital formation, allows for concentration of the land by use, and then it segments uh, the land and keeps, uh, let's say, polluting uh, manufacturers away from residential areas that in the end will uh, create health issues and cancer issues, uh, which becomes extremely costly for you need market research and due diligence and risk analysis. You need accepted valuation methodologies and market information. You need innovative and enforceable uh, deal or tax structures um, that you can utilize. The 1031 exchange here in the United States is one of the most used provisions of the tax code. It makes it very efficient to be able to transfer properties and defer your capital gains and your recapture tax for wealth and capital accumulation. <coughs> You need development capabilities, you need land, and you need management companies and development companies to be able to build out those facilities and build out those physical structures. So you need the institutions around real estate to be able to provide and build the real estate. You need public and private mortgage institutions and government, government institutions to work with these financial <coughs> institutions to credit enhance, because if the government institutions can credit enhance, such as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, that, that credit enhancement lowers the cost of capital for Fannie and Freddie, which lowers mortgage interest rates. That creates more affordable housing in the end. So you need institutions, um, uh, government institutions to credit enhance, and you need public and private mortgage institutions uh, to provide that liquidity. You need to be able to uh, transfer title through recordation, and you need title insurance companies 
that can basically ensure you that the title that you're receiving is clean title and there's no cloud on the chain of title. So that when you buy the property, you find out that two owners before never really transferred the property and the property that you just bought was actually still owned by the owner two times before. So that when they file a lawsuit, because they say they own the property, you've just now lost out on $20 million um, that you purchased the property for when you never really owned it. So having the, the recordation of the title and the uh, title insurance industry is extremely critical. And real estate is huge. I mean, it's a 15, maybe $20 trillion capital market. It's probably even more than that. If you look at all real estate on a global basis, it dwarfs the bond market and it dwarfs the uh, securities. It's huge. It's everywhere. Efficient global real estate and security markets require strong institutional investor interest based on clearly defined risks and rewards. We want to attract institutional capital in our firm. We want institutions, pension funds, endowments, mutual funds to buy our securities to give us the capital that we need to buy and build these, uh, trans these uh, intermodal facilities on a global basis. So we need institutional uh, participation in our company, but we need institutional participation as investors, not only in the security markets, but also in the real estate markets too. But institutions are not going to invest in your country, they're not going to invest in your securities or your real estate if they don't have transparency, if they don't have information, because they don't understand the risks and rewards associated with those investments. So you need that. Institutional investors are corporations, uh, pension funds, insurance companies, commercial banks, real estate investment trusts, which is what we are, and stock mutual funds. You need these types of participants within the marketplaces. That's what we're looking for, too. Europe has it, Africa does not have it. Uh, in, institutional investor requirements. This is what institutional investors are looking for. Uh, measurable risks and rewards. Uh, macroeconomic and local market stability. Clearly defined uh, ownership rights, corporate transparency and communication, portfolio diversification strategy and risk management tools, ideally derivative contracts, and the, the ability to get out exit strategies and convertibility and liquidity. If I'm an institutional investor, which is what we are um, as the real estate investment trust, and we have institutional investors that invest in our company shares and participate in our properties, at some point in time, we're going to run the analysis. I'm running the analysis. Our acquisition valuation department is running the analysis. And the point in which the net present value, the growth of the net present value equals the discount rate, you may want to write that down. The point in which the, the growth in the net present value, percentage change in the net present value equals the discount rate, that is the point in which you sell the asset point in which you sell the asset. And if the weighted average cost of capital is greater than the internal rate of return on the property, you're going to sell the property. If the all of a sudden the net present value turns negative on the property, when you're doing the wholesale analysis, you sell the property. So you're using measurable metrics and financial metrics to be able to make investment decisions, but also uh, exit strategies, disposition strategies too. It's just as important to know when to buy as it is to know when to sell. Uh, institutional investor outcomes. With institutional investor participation, you get lower information and capital costs, which, is, which means that overall valuations are propped up because the cost of capital is lower. You get increased liquidity and market efficiency. You get financial intermediation and financial innovation. You get efficient allocation of resources. You get public and private market discipline, and you get increased social welfare at the end of the day. Those are the things that we're looking for. So research prerequisites and the role of the global real estate and financial economist. This is you, because I'm going to be hiring you. I'm the director of research. I'm going to need a staff of probably 10 people, um, probably even maybe a staff of 100 people. I'm going to need at least one research manager in every office on a global basis, and I'm probably going to need at least two research analysts. Um, so I could be looking at at least maybe 100 researchers that I'm going to be managing on a global basis. Um, you need to be able to conduct fundamental analysis. We are going to conduct fundamental analysis. 
We're going to conduct economic, demographic analysis. We're going to be forecasting economic and demographic trends. We're going to be conducting real estate market research and real estate market forecasting. You're going to forecast occupancy rates, rents, net absorption, new construction, cap rates, uh, prices. Uh, we're going to be forecasting all of that stuff. Uh, we're going to be conducting technical analysis also. And we're going to be looking uh, from the financial market analysis and forecasting, we're going to be looking at trends. We're going to spot trends, we're going to be looking at cycles, we're going to know when to buy, when to sell, when to hold. Um, we're going to be looking at all, at all that on a technical basis. And then benchmarking um, the current market environment to long-term market trends against, some, against benchmarks. And we're going to do that against our portfolio and individual properties too. Um, financial engineering. Uh, we're going to be conducting uh, risk management and we're going to be innovating risk management strategies. If we go into a country and there's no derivatives available to us to, as tools to hedge off market risk within the marketplace, uh, we can probably create some kind of private labeled um, security and maybe find an investment bank uh, to basically underwrite it or find somebody to take the other side of the trade. Or we're going to design risk management strategies internal within the firm to basically mitigate risk that we may be associated with, both systematic and unsystematic risk. So the, uh, so the senior level managers will be looking to us to innovate new risk management strategies and maybe risk management tools that may be or may not be available to us, but that's what we do. We are financial engineers also, and we will create innovative strategies and products based on the risks that we're so the mission of, of, global, of the Global Capital Market Research Department is to improve the quality of information provided to corporate management and stockholders and stakeholders for decision-making purposes. That's our goal. Uh, we, our goal is also to identify demo, economic, demographic, and capital market trends and spot investment opportunities and look for uh, portfolio diversification and or concentration opportunities in the market. Uh, again, the goal of the research department is to create value through management and stockholder satisfaction. If we're providing research and guidance uh, to senior level managers and they can make accurate and decisive decisions, then we're creating value within the company. And the value is here within the company. And we, we will be compensated um, uh, for the value that we create and that we bring uh, to the company and the stockholders in particular. Uh, our goal is to improve the accuracy of economic, demographic, and capital market forecasts. The more accurate our forecasts are, um, the better able we are to basically move within the marketplace, to either avoid risk or to take advantage of opportunities that are presented to us. We are committed to improve the productivity, quality, and diversity of the research information provided. We provide different types of research, different types of reports, different types of intervals. We do daily reports, weekly reports, monthly reports, quarterly reports, biannual reports, annual reports. We do white papers on a customized basis. Um, we, do all, we do presentations. All the information that we produce are communicated to the marketplace through our investor relations department, our marketing department, um, and used for corporate uh, marketing in our annual reports and our shareholder meetings and to, and to the, uh, the public media for communications. Um, we look to improve investment and portfolio diversification and yield enhancement through risk mitigating strategies. If we know that the, one of the uh, governments are going to be toppled in Libya within the next three to five years, or a strong man is going to come in and basically create a civil war, we're out. We have to sell off our properties as quickly as possible while there's still, still liquidity in the marketplace and get out of the country completely, if we can. That's just an extreme example. Or we see that a, a country is now moving towards a democratic capitalistic model. They've opened up their economy to global trade. They've privatized, securitized, and it looks like the judicial <laughs> system um, and the legal system has adopted private property rights. They have a, a lawyer, a deep lawyer base. They have judicial decisions that are being based, uh, decided based on precedent and moral philosophy. And we start checking off the boxes. Those are the countries that we want to go into. Information systems. Uh, we need to assure that the quality of information 
uh, by maintaining a state-of-the-art analytical uh, computer hardware software database reporting system. This is totally critical. Uh, now with the advancement in cloud computing, now with the advancement in artificial intelligence and machine learning, now with the advancements in, in using R and Python and SQL Server and other applications, both custom and off-the-shelf applications, we're constantly looking for innovations in technology. We're constantly upgrading the hardware and the software applications. We develop our own software applications uh, to be able to solve some of these problems and always be ahead of the curve and always providing cutting edge research and information by using a state of the art uh, technology platform. So we work very closely uh, with the IT departments on a normal basis and in the uh, in the headquarters, we have distributed computing capabilities across the globe, and we have centralized computing capabilities in the home headquarters office in San Francisco. So what is the role and responsibilities of the global real estate and financial economists? My role is to act as an independent agent representing the long-term interests of the shareholders through objective and unbiased research. If I believe that there is a detrimental situation that is coming, I will disclose that information to the board of directors and senior level management. And in the most extreme situation, I will disclose the information to the media and I will disclose the information to the um, institutional investors if I believe that senior level management is acting unethically, immorally, or illegally. So I will put my reputation and my job on the line. And I've done it before. Uh, after 9-11, um, uh, after September 11, in 2001, when I saw the, the, the Twin Towers go down in New York, I knew that we were going to fall into a recession because when uh, Wall Street grinds to a halt for a month and Washington gr grounds to a halt for a month, there's going to be a recession. And we were very far in the, in the business cycle at that time, too. I had already produced the quarterly reports to be distri distributed to the board of directors. They were sitting in my office in the packages ready to be mailed out on 9-11. I took the reports at, on the day of 9-11 and I threw them in the garbage can because they were basically worthless at that point in time because everything had changed totally in the world. Uh, the senior level managers came into the office, the CFO, the CEO, the COO came into my office and said, where's the report? You said it was already done. You said you were going to mail it out today. Um, I'm not done is what I told them. And I basically uh, delayed them for two weeks so that I could go back and rerun all of the forecasts under a recession scenario. I redid the packages, redid the reports, I mailed them out to the se uh, senior level managers and the <coughs> directors without consulting senior management first. Because I knew that if senior management knew what I was doing, they would block the research, they would modify the forecast, and they would make me uh, mail out an erroneous report to the board of directors. Did you stay in that position for very long? Uh, I lasted about two and a half years after that. Oh. But after, um, after they received the report and they saw that I had predicted a recession uh, for the next two years and then a recovery after that, uh, they basically said that I should be fired for not consulting them first. And who blocked your... It was the CFO of the company. And then the CEO basically came back to me and said, you need to redo the reports. I said, well, I've already done the reports uh, already. And he said, no, um, you need to uh, be working with us to basically adjust your forecasts. And we're going to guide you on your forecast. And you're going to re redo the report. And you're going to mail it back out to the board of directors as a new report. I said, fine. Because I had already sent the original report to the board. So I already disclosed all of the information to them. He said, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll do it again. I mailed it out. It made them look really bad. So within two, two years, uh, they were gone. Uh, the CFO was gone, the COO, the CEO had retired. They took their money and left. A new uh, president, the CEO, came into the company. She came to me uh, before I, I was leaving the company because they had laid me off, uh, but they hired me back under a three year contract to provide basically the same services. So I ended up working for them for about five and a half years after being with them seven. So she came to me and she said, I want you to take a look at this, because before you leave, I want you to do a presentation to the board of directors. And I said, great. And she said, look, uh, what I did over the last two and a half years, I basically looked at the return series of our actual portfolio. 
uh, and then map them against your forecasts, your original forecasts, and then map them against the uh, modified forecast that management basically had forced you into making. And my forecasts were basically 90% accurate in predicting the actual portfolio performance over the three-year time period. So I had some basic, some vindication. When I left, I had my credibility. When I left, um, I was able to walk out of there with a reputation. And they got picked up very quickly after that. Yes? Are there no laws protecting you from being fired for just disclosing the truth? Uh, I wasn't fired, I was laid off. Okay, and it's an at-will situation. Okay, but I was able to go off, on after that started a brokerage firm, became a, a wealth advisor, and then got picked up by Global Real Analytics and Charles Schwab to build the first transaction series of real estate indexes and launch the property derivative market, which was my, my goal originally when I started in economics in the early 1980s. That's what I wanted to be when, in my 20s. So I ended up where I wanted to be from that, that situation. But this is really, really important, and you all will be confronted with this. Okay, And you're going to have to make um, you need to, the role is to conduct ongoing economic and capital market research, provide timely guidance for secondary market investments, initial public offerings, and risk and portfolio management programs. So I'm not only advising on the acquisition side and the portfolio management side, but I'm also advising basically as an internal investment banker on the state of the capital markets to issue uh, either initial public offerings, secondary offerings in both our equity and our debt, and maybe even uh, consulting on the possibility of setting up a commingled fund, an institutional product for institutional investors to participate in our properties and our portfolios. So I could do that too. My responsibility is to provide research assistance to corporate management, uh, to analyze portfolios for over and under concentration in the market, economic and geographic risks, and to conduct portfolio optimizations. We took my, investment, my investments class, that's what we did. We also uh, created a, a static portfolio in this class. So we do portfolio construction uh, and optimizations. Uh, my responsibility is target markets and investments for future acquisition and underwriting based on fundamental economic and demographic demand and <coughs> dynamics. When you're in acquisitions and when you're in underwriting, when you, when you reach a certain level within your career, you have a major impact on investment decisions. And you need to be making investment decisions based on good, solid data and research in an unbiased and unpolitical environment. Okay. You can't have people putting political pressure on you to do a deal because they're going to be compensated or they're going to be rewarded to it. You make the decision based on good, solid economic and financial and market rules. Uh, you need to maintain databases and generate and write market research reports on a timely basis. Daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, biannual, annual. The board of directors comes to you and says we want to enter uh, a Southeast Asian market, it hasn't been developed yet. We need to, you to do a country report and basically assess the country and find out if it's someplace that we want to enter, and I need it by tomorrow. Okay, maybe by the end of the week, but I want to draft tomorrow so we can look at it. And I want to look at it at least twice before, uh, and I want to sign off, I want senior level management to sign off on it, and I will build the PowerPoint presentation, and I can make the, the presentation to the investment committee and the board of directors, or senior managers can do that. But I'm heavily involved in the process of putting together that information and that communication. Um, here are some examples of global research projects. So these are basically the uh, research agenda. This is basically the business plan. These are the research products <coughs> that I'm going to produce. These are my product lines. These are the services that I'm going to provide to internal uh, senior management. And we're we're going to produce capital market research reports. We're going to analyze and prioritize target markets and investment for future investments in underwriting. We're going to work very closely with the development and acquisition teams on a global basis. Uh, economic and capital market portfolio diversification. We're going to measure economic and industry concentrations. 
in correlations between employment and investment returns and trends across capital markets and investment in our portfolio. So we're gonna look at the overall markets in these countries. We're gonna benchmark our portfolio against the market. And if we're not outperforming the market, we can't outperform the market, we have to change some of the management uh, policies and the management structure so we can con consistently outperform and create alpha um, for the company on an ongoing basis. We're gonna conduct portfolio optimization. We're gonna create passive allocation strategies on a global basis. And we're gonna measure portfolio diversification against an index. If the index is not available, we're gonna build our own indexes internally. Or take other indexes and create our own customized index. We'll probably be using multiple indexes to benchmark. <coughs> uh, we're also gonna use active strategies and measure portfolio diversification based on required return, risk tolerance, and market constraints. That's the Markowitz model of the investments class that's your active portfolio strategy. We can do that at the real estate level, we can do it at the securities level too. Uh, in future market expansion, we're gonna be analyzing and prioritizing foreign and domestic capital markets and or company investments. So we're gonna be doing, looking constantly looking for where are we gonna expand next? And do we stay in large scale warehousing distribution facilities or do we migrate into other types of uh, compatible product types um, that are compatible with warehousing distribution facilities. Maybe we do manufacturing or do something else. Maybe we look into other, expand into other markets based off of our business model. So we're constantly looking at ways to grow our revenue, to grow our funds from operations, to increase our stock price, and to create wealth uh, for our stockholders and our shareholders, because that's the ultimate goal at the end of the day, is sh shareholder maximization. Uh, the, the reports and the services that we're going to produce, uh, we're going to provide that uh, to corporate management for strategic planning. Uh, we're going to do capital market research so we can determine our weighted average cost of capital. We're going to conduct securities analysis, and we're going to look at our competitors and look at their share prices, and we're going to con conduct intrinsic valuations, and we're going to benchmark our, ourselves against our competitors and conduct the securities analysis which is what you're going to do um, after next week. We're going to start next week to do the bank intrinsic values. If you took my 123, we did intrinsic valuation. So not only do we do market research, we also do capital market research and security market research. We do stock market research, equity research, and fixed income. So a lot of those people are CFAs, you know, or, C, or they've been um, CPAs um, working you know, in public accounting. Uh, we're going to do market and economic analysis, uh, product market research and business development. We're constantly looking at, at conducting marketing research to figure out if our warehousing distribution facilities should be including sustainability pro, uh, uh, types of materials. Should we have solar on every one of our, um, our buildings? Should we have reclamation? Should we have fuel cells? We're all constantly looking at modifying the existing product for product innovation, because that's what the investors are looking for, to us for innovation. Um, so we're gonna conduct marketing research. Uh, portfolio management, we're gonna conduct economic-based diversification. Does, the, does our portfolio, the companies in our portfolio by sector, sector concentrations within our portfolio match up to the broader economy? Or are we over or under concentrated in any one sector? Our company has historically been over-concentrated in tech companies. If the tech sector goes down like it did in 2001, two, and three, our portfolio is gonna be significantly impacted by basically bankrupt tech companies. So maybe we should diversify, reduce our concentration to tech companies and increase our concentration to consumer durables or other types of more defensive uh, <coughs> sectors of the economy so that our portfolio composition of tenants by sector matches more of the broader economy as opposed to over and under concentrating. We can figure that out through economic-based diversification analysis. Fundamental and technical stock in real estate market research. Again, we're gonna be conducting the technical analysis. As you've learned in these courses, we're conducting technical analysis. We're looking for trends. Uh, we're looking for breakouts. We're looking for supports, resistance, 
lines, we're looking, we're using technical analysis in conjunction with the fundamental analysis to basically spot and verify trends, not only in the security markets, but also in the real estate market. <coughs> and we're going to monitor uh, the markets constantly, both the capital markets and the real estate markets. We're going to produce weekly reports, monthly reports, now with automation and technologicalization within real estate, we can now produce minute by minute reports, daily reports, weekly reports, quarterly reports, and we create dashboards that basically will alert, alert us if anything within our portfolio or our properties get out of whack, uh, we, can, we can identify the variances very quickly and address any of the issues at the operating level or the market level very quickly now, because we have the technology to be able to do that. And we're creating automation through machine learning and artificial intelligence to be able to identify anything that gets out of control instantaneously and we can go and address the issues as quickly as possible to rectify it. <clears throat> Acquisitions, investments, dispositions, exit strategies, development, and underwriting. We are, uh, we are integral to the due diligence process. Any acquisition, any development, any underwriting, in sec any securities issuance, we are involved in the process as independent, unbiased agents within the company, providing transparency and the best information possible for due diligence purposes. We're going to do economic and real estate market analysis and produce research reports. And we're also going to be able to tie in the markets. We're going to look at the historical business and real estate and capital market cycles. And we're going to make recommendations on when to issue the shares, when to buy back the shares, when to sell the properties, when to buy the properties, when to develop the properties and also uh, advise on uh, what type of potential institutional investors that we want to partner with um, in those acquisitions or those issuances. Uh, investor and client relations, we work very closely with the investor relations department and the marketing department, providing them with research and information that they can integrate into public releases to the public, to the journals, use our information for industry, research conferences, presentations by senior level managers, annual report presentations, um, uh, the website, um, everything. We're, uh, we're integrated with the investor relations of the marketing departments and the communication departments uh, for public relations and for investor relations, which is critical. That's what we do. Okay, that's our role. That's our so hopefully, and this was helpful to be able to provide you with basically a frame because what's going to happen is in probably the next maybe 5, 10, 15, maybe 20 years, within 20 years, you will be managing your own department. You will be asked to come and build a department like I have four times. You will come to me and say, I want to build a product. I want to build a research department. Will you build it for me? Yes, here's the business plan, here's the business model, and then we're going to execute it. And I'm going to hire you to come in to help me be able to build out the vertical and add value to the shareholders. Um, for the, so you were talking, in terms of real estate, you were talking about like the necessary, I don't know, financial and insurance type of policies in place in the countries in which you're going to invest in. Yeah, um, we need title insurance companies within those countries to verify that the uh, title mm -hmm. has been transferred cleanly through the chain. There's no clouds on the title. There's yeah. no encroachment on the property. So that the property that we're actually buying, the title reflects actually what we're buying so that we can receive the title to the land and to the property so that we own it. And so what about for the other side, for the consumer side? Should there be policies in place for that as well? Like, let's say renter's insurance is really important in that region. Yeah, the, the, what we're going to do is, is our, in our facilities, since mm -hmm. they're state of the art, the minimum size of our facilities are 100,000 square feet, up to a million square feet. What we're looking to, when we underwrite the tenants, and when we underwrite a single tenant to occupy those facilities, we're going to underwrite their credit. And we're usually looking for maybe AA or AAA rated uh, companies. Um, that have already issued debt and that have transparency and are publicly traded in most cases. Uh, but we're going to need all of that financial information to be able to make, to do our due diligence to then sign a lease between us and the tenant 
and have that lease contract be backed um, by the credit of the company. And maybe a, a letter of credit may need to be signed by a bank to enhance the credit to make sure that the lease payments are, are paid on time. How often are you looking at those buildings with five, six, seven, eight tenants? Uh, usually what we'll do is in most cases we've moved more towards a build a suit model where basically Amazon will come to us and say we want you to, to build a million square foot you know, warehousing distribution facility in Reno, which is basically what we did. And uh, they will come to us and they'll be a single tenant. Uh, we will look at uh, warehousing distribution facilities of multiple tenants. We don't want to have too many tenants. We want to maybe have four maximum, let's say 100 <coughs> square foot, 100,000 square foot facility, uh, 25,000 square feet, four tenants, 25,000 square feet each. And when you fill the building with them, do you make them put up the um, infrastructure, or not the infrastructure, but it really depends do on you the, make them build out their own space, or do you it, give them money? It really depends yeah. on the client. Like in some cases, they want us to put the tenant improvements in. Yeah. Uh, we, we are willing to do that up to a certain point, and then they'll do the rest. Or they'll just say, give us a clean shell, and we'll build it out ourselves to our own specifications. So we're, we're pretty flexible. Did you ever, like, regardless of your research, run into any unexpected issues when you pick out a country that you want to go to? Yeah, usually the problem is lack of information. Yeah. So, um, either there's not institutions in place that provide uh, the data. We have, like, the census here. We have title companies. We have uh, real estate brokerage firms here that are global that we work with, you know, closely to get the data. But some of the real estate transaction data is still pretty hard. Uh, we rely on uh, Real Capital Analytics and CoStar to provide us with the real estate data, but they've only entered the market over the last five years. So they don't have a lot of historical data. And the data is still very hard to get to. And some of the transactions data and the building attributes data, we have to go out and verify that ourselves. Uh, because they don't have appraisers, uh, a very deep appraisal company, a real estate professional industry within these countries. So we're dealing with lack of information, erroneous information. Yeah. That's very costly to not only collect, but also to verify for investment decisions. That's the problem with going global. Yeah. Unless you're in the UK or Australia or New Zealand or you know the, the Commonwealth countries. Okay, any other? That was entertaining for you, and I hope you got a lot out of that lecture. Okay. All right. And I'll make the um, lecture available.